Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Sally Thurston from the Maynard Public Library, and we are delighted to have you with us tonight uh, from all across the country and in and Canada. So thanks for joining us. Um, I've been looking forward to this program for a long time, um, but waiting and waiting for uh, Seaside Escapes um, this, this August. Um, so a special welcome to our, fr our friends and neighbors in Wayland and Lincoln, um, who are also sponsoring this program, the Lincoln Public Library and the Wayland Free Public Library, as, long, as, as alongside the Maynard Public Library. Um, I'd like to thank all three friends groups for their support. Um, and I encourage you all to sign up for your library's newsletters and support your friends groups and stay in touch and keep joining us for excellent programs. Um, Jane will be um, presenting for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes. Um, as questions come to you, you can put them in the Q&A um, and she'll answer them at, at the end of the talk. Um, we have enabled transcription tonight. So if you'd like to, to watch a transcript as we, talk, as we go along, um, you can turn on that function. Um, and now it's our very great pleasure to welcome Jane O'Neill back to the Maynard Lab Library. Um, uh, Jane has has given has given us I don't know a dozen presentations Who knows at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's always a delight and wonderful to have her with us again. Um, Jane holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard. Uh, she's worked at some of New Hampshire's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Uh, she's taught art history at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. Uh, so in celebration of summer and um, vacations to the shore, uh, Jane will be speaking tonight about Seaside Escapes, the art and architecture of the New England coast. And over to you, Jane. Thanks so much, Sally. And thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about the art and architecture inspired by um, the beautiful shoreline of New England. We're in for such a treat. I just feel like this is the time of year where everybody begins to think, have I really taken advantage of everything that I could have this summer? And my hope is that this program inspires a few road trips, especially for those of you that are local, maybe a few long distance trips for those of you a little further afield. Um, so for now, relax, sit back, imagine your toes in the sand. We're going to get as close to the beach as humanly possible without actually traveling there. So tonight we'll be looking at incredible works by some of America's most celebrated art artists and architects. And, um, and like I said, I hope that this inspires a few road trips. We will be getting back to this glorious image on the screen a little bit later. But what I wanted to do was start off with a, a little bit of a variety show for you. It's going to kind of prime the pump for the images that we're going to consider tonight. So I just wanted to give you kind of a a sense in terms of how different artists have approached this subject over the years. And just to get started, this is a fairly local beach. This is a, a beach in Beverly, Massachusetts, painted by the Hudson River School landscape painter, John Frederick Kensett. This was done in 1860. And it, Whenever I look at it, I'm, I'm sort of in awe in terms of the detail captured. I mean, you feel like you could walk right out on the sand there. This is a very straightforward, realistic depiction of the beaches in New England, but you kind of feel like you're there when you look at it. Um, I myself am really a sucker for these kinds of images though, uh, done by a fellow Hudson River School artist, the German-American Albert Beardstadt. This is a painting called Seal Rock from 1872. It's in a private collection and you see this incredible churning sea. You get this uh, sort of spotlight effect, imagining the sun filtering down through the clouds. And just these little areas where we can see the seafoam green light shining through these waves, these cresting waves here. It's just so dramatic and really just remarkable that a, an artist back in 1872 could kind of freeze time in, in this wonderful way. 
Now, other artists have approached the topic of the sea and the coast in with a very different focus, a really different interest. This is a painting by William James Glackens done in 1918, and it's called Beach Scene, New London. So I'm imagining this is New London, Connecticut. And if you've ever been to Ocean Beach there, it is always crowded with people. So people are the focus, how they're interacting with each other, how they're enjoying this time by the shore. I love all the people kind of lazing about um, in, in the sand here. And then the details a little further back with the architecture in the sailboat in the distance. Now, um, other artists, when they think about the coastline, they're not concerned with people at all. They eliminate people from the landscape. And this is an absolutely glorious image by the watercolor painting, painter, Charles Demuth. And it's called Provincetown Dunes from 1914. It's sort of soft, it's ethereal, the colors are otherworldly. It just kind of transports you to a special place, whether or not it's the beach, it could be, you know, the surface of the moon, but it's it um it really is just transcendent the way he uses these colors here and these kind of beautiful undulating lines. Uh, just a really uh, interpretation of the shoreline. So the last image that I wanted to show you to sort of prime the pump is a little bit funny. This is Roy Lichtenstein's Nude on a Beach from 1977. He's an artist who is always inspired by comic books. And I get such a kick out of this image, imagining that this is supposed to be some sort of alluring or sensual nude lying on the beach with her shovel, her blonde hair. And of course, her body is this um, anamorphic blob with these little holes in it's sort of similar to this piece of Swiss cheese, which is inexplicably joined her on the beach. And I hate to break it to you, spoiler alert, this is unfortunately the only nude in tonight's program. So drink it in, enjoy it now. <laughs> Let me give you a sense in terms of how we'll use the rest of our time tonight. Uh, we'll get started with, uh, well, considering art colonies in and, and that whole tradition in New England. We'll focus in on one art colony in particular, and then we'll turn our attention to some of the greatest artists in uh, the history of American art. And I do love a little so we've got Winslow Homer, Child Hassam, and Edward Hopper there. We'll be looking at their seascapes. <laughs> Excuse me. And then our last section focuses on architecture, the quaint little cottages of Newport, Rhode Island, and then the very eclectic house of Beauport in Gloucester, Massachusetts. So lots to consider. Let's dive in. Forgive the pun. Okay, so art colonies, the lure of the shore. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment being an artist at the end of the 19th century or at the beginning of the 20th century. You're probably based out of New York City, maybe Boston. And during the summertime, this is like peak time to go out and paint some flowers, find some beautiful scenery, and to get out of Dodge. You want to escape the heat of the city, the hustle and bustle. You want to go someplace picturesque. So not surprisingly, art colonies uh, popped up from Monhegan Island in Maine through Agunquit down to Gloucester, um, Massachusetts, and um, in Cape Ann, and even in Provincetown, all the way down to Connecticut, where you have Coscob and Old Lyme. And the Old Lyme art colony in particular is very well documented. So we're going to zoom in on that one. And this is your first inspired road trip for tonight, because if you've never been to the Florence Griswold Museum in Old Lyme, Connecticut, this program might make you want to go there. So here she is. This is Florence Griswold over here on the left. She was born in 1850, died in 1937. And she, um, she was the daughter of, of, um, well, she came from a prominent shipbuilding family, I should say. But by the time she was middle age, she had this big Georgian home and it was kind of falling apart. And she had to figure out a way to make some money. She actually had to support a, a sickly sister at the same time. So she decided to rent out rooms, to let out rooms. And it became a popular place for artists because she would rent a room for $7 a week. So all of these artists escaping the city would go to this house. It was in nowhere near as pristine condition as you see it now. It was kind of a, a little bit run down. The paint was peeling off. The shrubbery was overgrown. But there was something about 
Florence Griswold that really created this incredible sense of community. She, and she was at the nucleus of it. And just to give you an example of that, this beautiful painting here by the artist Willard Metcalf depicts a sort of idealized vision of Florence Griswold approaching that same Georgian mansion that we were just looking at, which now looks like a Greek temple, right? And it's, um, it's sort of illuminated from within. It's underneath this um, starlit sky. It's called May Night from 1906. And Willard Metcalf recognized that this was a really good painting for him. He was one of these artists who was staying there with her and he'd actually hadn't paid his bill for quite some time. So he offered this painting to Florence Griswold. And she said, I absolutely can't take this. This is one of the greatest things you've ever done. Please go enter it into a competition or do something with it because it this, this is like your future essentially. So he did just that. He entered it into a competition it won a thousand dollar prize and today it's in the collection of the National Gallery of Art. So that's just one great example of how Florence Griswold knew how to give a leg up to the various artists that were com like coming together in her um, in her house at her property over the summers. Uh, mostly in the first two decades of the 20th century. So just to give you a sense in terms of what those artists look like, I love these pictures of them because they look so buttoned up and so prim and proper. If I was like an artist who was living by the seashore over the summer, I don't think I would be so formal when I went to go paint outside. But here they are. Um, and, and even though Old Lyme is right on, New, on um, Long Island Sound there. Most of these artists gravitated towards the Lieutenant River, which is a tidal river flowing into Long Island Sound. So you can see um, a, a female artist over here from behind who's working at her easel. The reason they gravitated towards the river, it was closer to, to Florence Griswold's home, but it also provided the opportunity to paint a lot of flowers. You don't necessarily get flowers when you're right up there on the beach. And flowers were an opportunity, a, a great subject really, for these American Impressionist artists to uh, make full use of this style, this style that was still very innovative in, in New England and in the United States at the time. So we have another Willard Metcalf painting over here on the left. This is William Robinson in the middle. And this is a gorgeous little painting by the artist Clark Voorhees over on the right. So these artists are always giving us a little peak of the water in the background, but they're they're using this loose kind of broken visible brush strokes in order to portray the, the gorgeous scenery that surrounded Florence Griswold's home. And at the end of a long day of painting, do you know what these artists did? They would go back to Florence Griswold's house and they would uh, have supper outside on her piazza. The men would typically sit at one table, the women would sit at another table, believe it or not, because they were considered so, you know, um, so sort of unkempt after a day of painting outside. But if you look at them today, they all look like they're, you know, buttoned up bankers over here. And the there was just this remarkable sense of community there. Uh, believe it or not, these formal looking men were making jokes, they were jovial, they were, they were boisterous, so much so that they gave themselves the nickname of the Hot Air Club, which I absolutely love. And now I want to call my friends and I the Hot Air Club too. So, uh, so there was this remarkable sense of these artists who were probably working pretty independently back in these cities, being able to share this sense of camaraderie when they come together. And you really see that in Florence Griswold's own dining room at her museum. So, um, well, at what is the museum today? So one of the things that the artists did while they were there, they sort of left a calling card or almost like some graffiti, if you could think of it that way, a way to say, I was here, a way to say it thank you. And this was kind of born out of um, artistic traditions in Europe. But, um, but they painted individual panels along the wall of her dining room, 38 individual panels to be exact, and a few more of these double panels. So I love this corner over here, this detail on the right. You can see another rendition of the Georgian mansion that uh, Florence Griswold own a lovely lady with a parasol over here. Each one of these images is just, you know, something I would love to own in and of itself. And then this beautiful little seascape, this kind of twilight seascape with the lanterns hanging in the, in the branches of the willow tree there. Just 
beautiful. So another view of this same room here, um, another corner, we can also see the fireplace. And just above the fireplace here is a nine foot long painting called The Fox Chase. It was done in 1905 by the artist Henry Rankin Poor. And this fox chase scene, I'm gonna show you a few details of it, is another great way to see how these artists came together and really didn't take themselves too seriously as they, um, as they strengthened these bonds amongst each other over the summer. So the fox chase, here we go. Here we have the fox, <laughs> but then we have this group of about 12 men. And these are artists, regulars at Florence Griswold's house over the summer. And, um, and if you think of like traditional fox hunts, it's usually men on horses and a lot of bloodhounds. But in this case, the men are running like they are those hounds. There's a silliness to this, right? But the fact that they're all running together in the same direction, sort of signifies to us, the viewers today, more than 100 years later, that there was a like-mindedness that these men shared and that sense of community, certainly. A couple of other really fun details from that nine foot long painting. Over here on the right, we can see Willard Metcalf who painted May Night um, working out on the beach at his easel. We see Florence Griswold's house over here at, um, on the edge of this detail. And then prominently in the foreground, a little bit of booze. So you can see that they're having a great time while they were staying there. This is yet another artist who uh, spent several summers at Florence Griswold's. This is um, Child Hassam and we'll be getting to know him in just a moment or two. But I thought this little peek inside this particular art colony gives us such a great sense in terms of how these artists came together, how they congregated, they shared ideas, they shared a, a similar subject and approach to painting that they could then um, that they could then take back to their studios, take back to their galleries in the cities and, and do a lot of selling hopefully in, in, in the fall. But summers sure seemed pretty ideal. We're gonna switch gears and we're gonna take a look at just a few artists, um, really celebrated American artists because these are some of the best and they are probably most closely associated with scenes of the shoreline, scenes of the ocean. So we're going to get started with none other than Winslow Homer. We can see him here in the photograph on the left looking rather serious. He was born in 1836, he died in 1910. He was an artist that really, um, came into his own and, and really made a name for himself in the middle of the, the, the Civil War in America. He was embedded with the Northern Army. He was making sketches to send back to Harper's Weekly that would then be um, transcribed into these prints. It informed the entire country what, the, what that war looked like. He turned one of his images into a painting. Um, done in 1863. This is called The Sharpshooter, and it's in the collection of the Portland Museum of Art. It gives us just a peek at what the Civil War looked like for Winslow Homer, and this was a particularly haunting scene for him and for the public that saw it, because what we're looking at here, of course, is somebody who is hiding. They're up in a tree. They're not to be detected, but they have a weapon of war with them that, um, when carefully trained, could take someone's life from half a mile away. So there was um, this horrifying power in, um, in a sharpshooter. And Winslow Homer himself wrote, wrote a little bit about that too. So even after the end of the Civil War, there was like a, a shadow over Winslow Homer because of the things that he'd seen. He created really beautiful kind of nostalgic scenes of American life after the war. This is a lovely painting called Snap the Whip that's in the collection of the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But these are sort of backwards looking. It's almost as though the Civil War never happened. America wasn't changing. It was almost as though people weren't moving to the cities. This is rural life and it's, it's very much idealized here. But there's also kind of a quiet to an image like this. And we get the sense that the shadow becomes even longer because when Winslow Homer was 47 years old, he decides to move 
to Prout's Neck, Maine. And he takes over this carriage house that was on the property of his family. And you can see that this carriage house is very close to the, to the shoreline here. And he, um, he lives in this carriage house. He uses it as a studio. And this is where his mature period in terms of his painting really happens. And this is where he zeroes in on the ocean, the shoreline as a subject matter. Now, incidentally, the studio is open to the public today. If you go to the Portland Museum of Art in Maine, you can catch a tour from there. I think it's a 20 minute little van ride out to Prout's Neck. I don't believe there's any original uh, Winslow Homer paintings at the studio, but it gives you a sense in terms of how he lived and what his process was like. So, um, so let's get just a, a closer view of that carriage house. It's been beautifully restored. Notice this upper level wraparound porch here. This was a place where um, he, he would often use for painting. And if we see it from a slightly different angle, that porch has the most breathtaking view of the Atlantic Ocean. And so he could really dive into his subject matter there. Now, Winslow Homer famously did not want to be disturbed while he was painting. So he cultivated a reputation of being a little bit of a recluse. He was called the Hermit of Prout's Neck, so much so that he even painted this sign that says snakes, snakes, mice, just to get to stop people from coming onto his property. Um, it's, it's better than saying keep out, right? <laughs> so like I mentioned, while he's working in Maine, while he's generating these images inspired by the sea, he is creating some of the most astounding images in the history of, uh, of American art. And I should mention that every major art institution in the country waters at the mouth when they see these because they all want one for themselves. So this particular painting is in the collection of the MFA in Boston. It's called The Fog Warning, and it dates to 1885. Now, Winslow Homer, looking out at the ocean, decides he's really going to focus on the power of the ocean and um, and sort of the smallness of, of, of humanity in the face of that awesome power. So with a picture like this, we see a figure, an anonymous fisherman in this little rowboat, this dory. He's already pulled some very large fish into the boat. He needs to make it back to this much larger ship that's on the horizon line. The fog warning means that he's heard the, the alarm. He needs to get back to that boat. We can see the fog rolling in here. The waves are really high. This is a choppy ocean here. And he is basically assessing, can he make it back in this moment? Now, this is high drama. This is like as good as HBO in the 19th century. Would you be able to make it back if you were sitting in that boat? How terrified would you be? So Winslow Homer is producing these um, almost like anxiety inducing pictures about just the awesome power of the ocean. And he goes on creating more and more images like this. This one is in the, Chicago, in the collection of the Chicago Art Institute. It's called Called the heron net. It's from the same year. We see two more anonymous fishermen working on the high seas. We see more of these larger boats in the background that they will be eventually connecting with, right? It's, um, a, it's a hazy day. It's overcast, but we see a little bit of this brilliant sunlight shining off of the hats of these fishermen, um, making these herring in the net just sparkle. So these men have their heads bowed. They've got this work to do. And I think most remarkably is that there's this figure here who is perched on the edge of this rowboat in these um, high waves, just so he can cantilever the weight of, of that net of fish coming into the boat. And I can tell you right now, if that were me, I would capsize the whole boat. We'd all be lost at sea. So once again, this is supposed to be high drama here. Will these men be able to kind of stay afloat in this precarious circumstance? And we see the drama really come to a head with this image from the Clark Art Institute in Western Mass. It's called The Undertow from 1886. And in this picture, we see two women who have been overcome by the ocean. They are being rescued. They're being saved, thank goodness, by two more anonymous sort of idealized men. In some ways, they look like they're, um, you know, uh, marble 
sculptures from ancient Greece. The, 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 the musculature is so perfect here, but it really is a, a, a picture about this dangerous, awesome power of the ocean. So as, as Winslow Homer gets to the, to the 1890s, he just decides like the people are superfluous to the story that he's trying to tell with these images of the ocean. And he decides to eliminate them. Actually, in this picture that we're looking at here from 1895 called Nor'easter, there were actually fishermen in the foreground in these rocks who were observing the waves. And even after he sold the painting, he decided to paint them out. They weren't even necessary. So now this painting is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but we have this you know, wild spray of um, from the ocean hitting these rocks. If you've been up to Maine, the, the Maine coastline, especially around Ogunquid, these are like the rocks of Maine. It has a very particular look. I encourage you all to go to the Cliff House, have a, have a nice beverage there. And it's just surrounded by, uh, by by these rocks and boulders that look just like this. And of course, a nor'easter is like this long, slow, powerful storm. So we get the sense that the waves are high, the sea spray is flying, and, and you know, the sky is dark and churning as well. We have a similar effect in this other painting from the 1890s called Weatherbeaten. This is in the collection of the Portland Museum of Art. These uh, quintessential main uh, rocks in the foreground. They just look like the ruins of an ancient city in some way, don't they? And, um, and then once again, we get the, the expression of the storm um, coming towards us in a picture like this. So we'll wrap up with uh, Winslow Homer with this sort of softened approach to the ocean. This is the year 1900. This is that title slide that we started with. And this is called, um, uh, West Point Prout's Neck. This is also at the Clark Art Institute. So we see here um, more of an attention to a, a, a specific kind of atmosphere in the sky. I always think of this as a sunset, but I guess it could just as easily be a, a, a sunrise. We have um, a looseness to the way that this paint is applied in the foreground. You can see the very specific color choices that he's made as he lays in these ribbons of color, um, the water flowing over these seaweed covered uh, boulders in the foreground. But it's really this arabesque of sea spray that, that extends into the sky across the, those, um, those uh, orange streaks up above that really just uh, grabs your attention. It's, uh, it's this moment that he is frozen in time and it's just so striking. So we have the awesome power of the ocean. We're gonna turn our attention now to an artist who is a generation younger than Winslow Homer. This is Child Hassam. He was born in 1859, he died in 1935. Here he is in an undated self portrait. He was without a doubt the most celebrated American impressionist of all time. You probably know him best through this image on the right, which is in the collection of the MFA in Boston. In fact, this image is the um, is the high, I guess the best-selling postcard at the MFA in Boston because it is a depiction of the Boston Common. And this isn't quite um, Child Hassam in that full Impressionist style yet. This is a painting from 1891. It's over the next few years, and especially his experiences over the summers that transform the way he approaches painting. Now, Child Hassam spent a few good summers with Florence Griswold. It's always interesting to think about how these women have shaped these men's artistic careers, just to give you a sense in terms of how he was painting when he was down at the art colony in Old Lyme. He created this beautiful image here called the bridge at Old Lyme in 1908. I mean, I look at that and I think he's just as every bit as good as Claude Monet here. But it was another woman who had a huge impact on Child Hassam. And it was this woman here who's named Celia Thaxter, who was a preeminent author of the late 19th century. And she and her family had this home on the Isles of Shoals, just off the coast of New Hampshire and Maine, just a few miles there. You can see it from the shoreline if you've never been to the New Hampshire coast before. And she would hold these summer salons for other authors. She actually had to extend her porch so that she could have a bigger living room to contain all these wonderful people that she was hosting. But she had people like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, all 
coming to her summer house. Uh, so you can imagine the conversations that were taking place there. And in addition to these great authors, there was Child Hassam. So he develops a strong friendship with Celia Thaxter. He falls in love with her garden there on the Isles of Shoals. And she and the garden become a great source of inspiration for him. So you can see there are a lot of poppies here. And, and this garden becomes a, a great subject for the full expression of American Impressionism. So he's created this idealized portrait of her the poppies sort of rioting in the foreground, and then that peak of the Atlantic Ocean um, off in the distance looking very blue and very serene here. So he worked there every summer for 30 years. Hard to imagine, but he certainly found a place that felt like home, felt like a great source of inspiration. He worked in oils and in watercolors, as you can see here. I should mention that he was going there long after Celia Thaxter died. That's how much he loved this location. And his paintings are considered so iconic, so essential to the American art canon that, um, that the same subjects de depicted from a slightly different angle were just snatched up by major institutions. So on the left over here, we have a picture that's at the Met and over here on the right, the National Gallery of Art. Now, if I had my choice, if I was the curator, I would definitely pick the one at the Met too. So um, in terms of, of an art trip for you, something to squeeze in before the end of the summer, you can still go and visit Celia Thaxter's garden on the Isle of Shoals today. So you could pack up a little canvas with you if you wanted and maybe do some painting while you're there. Be inspired by the same poppies that inspired child Hassam. Now, just a quick note too, Hassam like Monet and the other French Impressionists before him, was really drawn to the same subject, in this case, the ocean, again and again and again, in different weather, different times of day, different atmospheric conditions. And so he would go and just paint the ocean. This is a, a, a morning scene from the Isles of Shoals from 1890. I love this pink and lavender sky, the little dots of yellow and magenta in, um, in the ripples uh, and, and the waves in the foreground. And then he would paint these night skies too that are so beautiful and calm and rainbow and candy colored that are all about these incredible reflections as well. So um, so his, his, his inspiration from, from this New England coastline here really helped to shape his entire career. Now, the last major American artist that I wanted to touch on for tonight is Edward Hopper. And we can see him over here as a young man in the photograph on the left. He, um, he was born in 1882 and he lived much longer than the other artists that we've considered. He lived until 1967. Now, we oftentimes think of Hopper as a painter of urban alienation, of people sitting by themselves in city settings looking very forlorn, very lonely. This is uh, 1927's The Automat, um, with a woman sitting here in this kind of uh, melancholy isolation. He's also probably best known for his 1942 painting, uh, the Nighthawks, which is in the collection of the Art Institute of Chicago. We get the sense that we're walking down the city sidewalk, maybe we're in New York City in the middle of the night, and we glimpse into this well-lit diner, uh, these few people that are kind of perched along this counter, and we begin to imagine what is their relationship? Why are they up? Why are they out in the middle of the night? What are the conversations to be had there? And Hopper sets it up almost like a, a movie screen. Notice this giant plate glass window here. And you feel like you're almost watching film noir as you take in this picture, imagining what the possibilities are in terms of these relationships here. So Hopper and his wife lived in New York City and they had a very spare existence there. They lived in a four story walk up the entire time they were in New York City. And um, they didn't even have a bathroom in, in, in their apartment. So needless to say, they wanted to escape the city during, during the summers. And they found Cape Cod to be a great 
place for both of them. They were both artists and they ended up building a house in South Truro in 1934 and spending their summers there from that point on. So here's Hopper as an older man. There's Joe, his wife in, in the background. And you can see just how close they were to the water. Notice that giant window and um, how it, it led in so much light for inspiration for their work. Over on the right, we're looking at a painting called The Groundswell from 1939. And in some ways it's typical Hopper, right? We see a group of people that don't seem to be interacting. There's a stillness to them. We don't get the sense that they're, they're actively involved in something. They almost sort of seem to be assessing how they're going to navigate this buoy here, but they're not interacting with each other. The difference here is, is that the entire scene is just like bathed in this glorious light. The, the, the whole picture is um, these brilliant blues of summer. It transports you to like the most beautiful summer day you could ever imagine. I think the quiet that we feel here is also sort of due in part to when this was painted. Did. This was just a few years before um, the U.S. entered World War II, so that might explain a little bit of the of the unease. But Edward Hopper once famously said, "I suppose I'm not very human. What I wanted to do was paint sunlight on the side of a house." Now that's what Cape Cod allowed for him. This is a picture called the Corn Hill Truro from 1930. And in addition to painting the sunlight on the sides of these houses and on the side of these hills, he was still concerned with this, um, with light and shadow and the ability to kind of play um, voyeur in the lives of, of people living and visiting Cape Cod. So sometimes he would just drive around at night and kind of peek into people's windows. This is a, a picture called Rooms, Rooms for Tourists from 1945, which he probably just painted in his car. But you get a little bit of a sense in terms of what, um, what the architecture and the sense of, of um, of, of people inhabiting these spaces was like at that time. So going back to, to light in particular, we can see these three paintings here. This one's called Cape Cod Morning. This one's called High Noon. And then over here on the right, we have Cape Cod Evening. They weren't painted in this order <laughs> and they were actually painted uh, uh, several years apart from each other. There's more than a decade between all of these pictures. But you see Hopper going back again and again to this idea of a specific quality of light um, and how it affects the architecture. Now, interestingly, his wife sort of served as like his archivist. She would keep a record of everything he painted. And so she would make these little descriptions of what the paintings were about. Over here, she wrote something to the effect of, you know, a woman in pink is looking out the window to see what kind of, what, what the weather's gonna look like that day. And he said specifically, no, that's not what these paintings are about. They don't have stories to them. I'm not Norman Rockwell. Uh, just let it be what it is. It's just a woman in pink looking out a window. And once again, there's still so much mystery to these pictures. I, I think specifically in Cape Cod Evening, where we see this collie dog who's been alerted to something that's outside of the frame of the picture. We have a man and a woman who are in close proximity to each other, but they're not looking at each other. Her arms are crossed. We don't know if they just had an argument, but they're in... Um, in this landscape that looks sort of unkempt. It's in contrast to, uh, to this beautiful house that they seem to occupy. So, so many questions as you look at Edward Hopper. And I think he loved to create those mysteries in his paintings. This is a picture called The Lee Shore. It's a, in a private collection. It's painted in 1941. We have the gorgeous sailboats out on the open ocean. We have a sense of movement. Our eye kind of moves around in the circle following those sailboats. And then there's almost like a, a this kind of spinning form in the clouds to reinforce that circle. But my eye always goes to this house that seems to be perched right on the edge of the water. It is dangerously close to the ocean. It shouldn't be there. It doesn't quite make sense to me whenever I look at it, but Edward Hopper loved to create that sense of tension there, that sense of questioning, and probably his best known example of that 
is this image here called Rooms by the Sea from 1951. This is in the Yale University Art Gallery. So if you're anywhere near Connecticut, you can go and see it for yourself this summer, be transported to the Cape all over again. But this is it's a strange image, isn't it? We feel like we're in this kind of well-appointed house. We're in the middle of the summer. There are these gorgeous um, uh, blocks of light that are streaming in, in this room and in the room just beyond. The door is open and there is no dry land to set your foot on. It just seems like you would step right out into the middle of the ocean. It doesn't make sense. It's a uh, it's a realistic painting, but also a surrealistic painting all at once. So he leaves you wondering whenever you look at an Edward Hopper painting. Now, for those of you that are in New England, um, I've heard a lot of great things about the Edward Hopper exhibit that's at the Cape Ann Museum in Gloucester. So you might wanna put that on your calendar for the next few weeks. And I also wanted to share with you this other painting here. It's called October on Cape Cod. And I would say it's like one of the less remarkable Edward Hopper paintings that I've seen from Cape Cod. But just to give you a sense in terms of the, ve the very strong appetite for his work, this little painting sold for close to $10 million. Okay, so in, um, in our remaining time, we're gonna turn our attention to architecture and cottages, summer cottages in particular. And of course, when we think of summer cottages, we think of, um, very simple uh, uh, structures, uh, quaint little homes by a body of water. And so these summer cottages over here are a really good example of how oftentimes architecture that's built by the sea is purely functional. It's just there to provide a little bit of shelter and respite from the sun and the waves. If you've ever been to Martha's Vineyard, you know um, that the uh, that the gingerbread houses there provide a little bit more deco decoration and ornamentation, but um, but they're not ostentatious by any means. And then we get to Newport, Rhode Island. <laughs> and if you've never been to Newport, I'm assuming a lot of you have. Just as a reminder, it is um, this little spit of land. It almost looks like a, a boot in some ways. But this is a very deep, very calm harbor in here. So Newport has always been a destination for people that love to sail. And it's also located almost kind of equidistant from New York City and from Boston. So you can imagine all of these kind of um, titans of industry could easily access this as a summer location, but still be able to mingle with people of their class. Because this is a small little spit of land, there's also the opportunity to, um, to build on the waterfront on either side there. So this becomes a destination even by the middle of the 19th century. The first house I wanted to show you was one of the first grand estates that was built in, um, in Newport, Rhode Island. This was designed by the architect um, Seth C. Bradford, and the house is called Chateau sur Mer, which of course translates to the house on the water uh, or the ocean, and it dates to 1852. Now it's made out of granite, it's made out of brick, it's in this Italianate uh, kind of Victorian style. We've got a mansard roof here and these kind of Victorian towers. And the scale of this is a little bit deceiving because this house that we're looking at is actually 37 thousand square feet. It's a uh, it's built on on quite an impressive scale, but sort of inexplicably, Chateau sur Mer is not actually on the water. It's a it's a ways away from the water. So we have the water up here at the top of the image, and Chateau sur Mer is actually on this huge piece of property in, in the middle of of Newport. So you can imagine that the owner here, his name was William Shepherd Wetmore, who was um, a very successful merchant in the old China of trade. He wanted to entertain, he wanted to impress people, but it was really with his expansive land and not breathtaking views of the ocean yet. But of course, leave it to the people of, of Newport, or at least the, the people that summered there, to kind of up the ante from there. <laughs> so this next house that I wanted to show you is called Rosecliff, and it was designed by McKim, Mead, and White for a silver heiress whose name was Teresa Fair Ulrichs. 
And it, the source material for this beautiful house that we're looking at was literally one of the smaller palaces in the complex of the Palace of Versailles. So for this American heiress here, they're letting her play Marie Antoinette. <laughs> and um, so they've added in all of these elements. It's an H-shaped house. The central part is, um, is actually just the ballroom. It's the largest ballroom in all of Newport. We'll just glance at it here. Um, what a lovely setting. It's been of the setting for various movies over the years too, including um, True Lies and The Great Gatsby. As we go back to that facade though, you can see it looks like a simple two-story structure here. There is actually a third story to it. It's a little bit set back. You can almost just glimpse it. There's a balustrade here to sort of um, hide it, but you do have to provide some housing for your servants. So that's just what they did here. But the rest of it is, is really all ostentation. Now, this is a house that is, um, is right on the water. It sits on six and a half acres. So you can imagine after the various events that took place in that ballroom, people could just kind of promenade right down and, and listen to the waves kind of lapping the shore there. Now, not to be outdone, enter the Vanderbilts. <laughs> now, the Vanderbilts were one point, the most wealthy family in America, if not in the entire world. By the time they're building in Newport, Rhode Island, this is generational wealth at this point. We're talking about the grandsons, essentially, of Commodore Vanderbilt. Um, and they certainly still have a lot of, of money to their names, but their days are really uh, busy spent uh, spending this money. <laughs> so this is William Vanderbilt's home, um, the Marble House. And actually, I I misspoke. This is a home that he had built. It was designed by Richard Morris Hunt. He had it built for his wife, Alva's 39th birthday. We should all be so lucky, right? So, um, so the marble house, it has 50 rooms inside. Here's the grand staircase. Inside, there is more than 500,000 cubic feet of marble. They imagined this house as being like a temple to the arts in America. It was unparalleled in terms of its opulence, um, in, in, in terms of American design, really. If it were to be sold today, it would go for well over $300 million. Now, um, sadly, the Vanderbilts got divorced just three years after this house was built. So Alva, the wife, got to keep this house to herself. And believe it or not, she didn't spend a lot of time there. She did go to Newport quite a bit, um, was very much involved in the society of Newport where women would change their clothes six times a day. There was all these expectations. And apparently there were great laundry systems that were built into the marble house. So she kept this house as essentially the world's most expensive laundry mat. Now to her credit, there is this little, um, uh, um, like a, a, a Chinese tea house in the backyard of the marble house, which you can see also sits right on a piece of property on the coastline. And she would use that little tea house um, to support the, the cause of, of women's suffrage. She would hold little rallies there. So at least she was doing something uh, positive with, uh, with all of her wealth there. So um, we'll end our look at Newport with the granddaddy of them all, the Breakers. And you can see from the Breakers here, just beyond their Chateau, sur mer that we saw before. Now the Breakers is, um, is the largest, the most ostentatious of all of these Newport mansions that, um, that we have access to these days. And this was once again designed for the Vanderbilt family. This was designed for Cornelius Vanderbilt II. So I believe he was the grandson of Commodore. Um, once again, generational inherited wealth here. You can see that it is sitting on this incredible piece of property uh, that, uh, that uh, goes straight to the ocean here. And this is 14 acres. The house itself is so big, it takes up a whole acre here. And if we zoom in just a little bit closer, we can see it's um it has this appearance of like a Renaissance style palazzo here. So it's made out of um out of limestone, if I'm remembering correctly, and it has this terracotta roof. It seems pretty clearly like it's made uh, that it's composed of these three. Uh, stories, but there is a sort of a secret 
fourth floor here. And that is once again, where all of the servants would live. Love to see these manicured gardens too. Now, if you were so lucky as to get an invitation to the breakers, you would start out here outside of this 30 foot high gate. If you have this much wealth, you need to keep the riffraff out, right? So I believe the fences were uh, somewhere between 12 and 14 feet high. They wrap all the way around the property, all the way to the ocean. You got to keep these people out. So you get through this gate and you go over here to the port cochere where you would get out of your carriage. There is sort of a hidden front door to um, to the breakers because really the house is oriented towards the sea. So you get out of your carriage, you'd go through this entrance here, and then you'd come through this door into the grand hall here. And this hall, I mean, look at it. It's covered in gold. It's filled with these marble columns. It is so over the top ornate. It really does look like a palace from Europe or one of the greatest museums in, in this country country. But um, if you could tear your eyes away from this, you could walk right across this grand hallway and out to this open air portico and take in this breathtaking view of the ocean here. I mean, this is this is how to live, right? This is <laughs> this is the good life here. So I wanted to just quickly show you a couple more rooms from the Breakers. This is the music room. It's really hard to believe that this isn't Versailles, but this was a room that they oftentimes used for entertaining and debutante balls. They also had this beautiful billiards room, which was covered in marble mosaics. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but essentially the entire ceiling here is just clad in, in these mosaics. And then um, the very famous dining room, which um, in and of itself is over 2,400 square feet. So it's bigger than the average American home. That dining room table could expand to seat close to 40 people. There's crystal chandeliers. There's, there's gold gilding um, all over the ceiling, the walls, these incredible um, uh, freestanding rose alabaster columns. It is the height of ostentatious wealth, isn't it? I mean, imagine having dinner at the Breakers. So we're going to end in a much more humble space here. And this is actually Cornelius Vanderbilt's bathroom. But I wanted to show it to you because there's um, there's some pretty incredible technological innovations here. In this marble tub, you'll notice that there are various um, handles. So as he's sitting in his tub, he could turn one handle and get uh, sea salt or salt water, I should say, a salt water bath, or he could get a fresh water bath. He could have hot, he could have cold. So all of these kind of technological innovations are built into this house. And I wanted to leave us on this note because there's a lot of innovation in the last house that we're going to look at today, which is really a world away from Newport, Rhode Island. This is Beauport in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Now, most of those Newport mansions um, are owned by the Newport Preservation Society. You can go and visit them today. You can also visit this house. This is owned by Historic New England and it's called Beauport or the Sleeper McCann House. It dates to about 1908 and it was designed by the, uh, the decorator and designer, uh, Henry Davis Sleeper. Now he was, he had a very eclectic taste and he was somebody who, um, who kind of infused a great deal of whimsy in his designs. There's just something so appealing about what he did, but he would combine it all. There was no sense of cohesiveness. It was just room after room after room. And he almost couldn't stop building, so much so that his neighbors had to put up, I think it was like a 14 foot wall, and he built to within inches of it. He really maximized the space here. So this um, this little house here is actually 14,000 square feet. There's somewhere around 50 rooms inside of it, but all of this is happening on less than an acre of land. So you're probably dying to see the inside. Very quickly, I just want to remind you that we 
are in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and this is right on the water in, in this bay here. So a pretty quick drive for a, a lot of us to get there. Now, if you were to arrive by water or to sort of sail by, this is what the back of Beauport looks like. And I am the first to say it is a mess. <laughs> this is a mishmash of styles. There's nothing cohesive about this, but it gives evidence to the fact that A, this house is a right on the water. It's literally on this cliff. And that B, Henry Davis Sleeper was just salvaging these different windows, these different architectural styles, and just popping them into different rooms that he was building. So every room has its own very unique um, identity. So this is um, his two-story China trade room. And the entire room was inspired by this wallpaper that he found. Um, I, I believe it was hand-painted wallpaper that at one point belonged to one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence or of the Constitution, one of those. Um, and so he designed a whole room sort of inspired by that and that concept, that aesthetic there. And even though it is a two-story high room, it's almost like in miniature in some in some sense. This is like a balcony overlooking it. All of these spaces aren't um, the traditional height ceilings that you might imagine. Now I know that there's somebody with us tonight from Delaware who's probably visited Winterthur at some point. And I will say that Henry Davis Sleeper um, had a huge impact on the design of, of Winterthur, which is one of the largest houses in America. So, um, so as I as I take you through Beauport, you're, you'll see some familiar things, and there are certainly rooms at Winterthur that look like this. Winterthur, incidentally, if, if you're not familiar with it, is now um, a museum essentially dedicated to furniture and the decorative arts. It's down in, in Delaware, very much worth the trip. So here's another room from Beauport this is called the octagon room. The walls are this beautiful aubergine with these red highlights. And um, Henry Davis Sleeper had a lot of fun thinking about the shapes, the colors, and the numbers that he could uh, uh, place in this room in order to reinforce that greater theme. So you can kind of go through rooms like this, and it's almost like a treasure hunt, looking for things that are in um, in groups of eight throughout the, throughout the space. So very clearly, and obviously, the table is, but you can find a lot of other things as well. And I should mention that this house is like a labyrinth. You could very easily get lost in it, and it's just room after room that um, uh, just uh, almost built in, in like three quarter size. They're, they're, they're uh, very tight spaces. Here is Henry Davis Sleeper's Colonial Kitchen. And I absolutely love this because he just met, he, he'd been collecting things over the years and he just imagined, I'll just put it all out. And so we get this sense of this very crowded hearth over here. And, um, and people just assumed that what Henry Davis Sleeper presented was the way that um, colonial Americans actually uh, uh, organized and uh, their, their own kitchens and how they used it. When in fact, colonial kitchens looked at nothing like this. They were in no way <laughs> this cluttered. They didn't have all of these different pots and bowls and that sort of thing. So. Um, in, in, his, in his professional work, sometimes uh, Henry Davis Sleeper kind of misled people, uh, it, not in any sort of um, sinister way, but, but historic sites like Old Sturbridge Village kind of got the wrong message in terms of what colonial American kitchens looked like because of Henry Davis Sleeper. Now, this next room is, I think, a favorite for so many people, including myself. This is a two-story high uh, round book tower that Henry Davis Sleeper designed. And again, it's a very tight quarters here. Uh, you could have just a few people standing in this book tower and it begins to feel pretty crowded. Now, this chair in the image on the left corresponds to the chair that we see over in the image on the right. And it's really these curtains in these windows that inspired the entire book uh, book tower, because those curtains are carved out of wood. And Henry Davis Sleeper found them. He knew that he needed to create some, some arched windows like this, and he decided to create a, a book tower all around them. It was the curtains that inspired the room. Pretty amazing. 
So you can duck out of a room like this and quickly run into one of his colored glass installations. He loved to collect colored glass and he displayed them against these kind of false windows that have natural light pouring into them. And you get the sense that he is essentially making these modern stained glass windows. They are so striking, so beautiful. Makes you want to just like run out to a thrift shop and start collecting as much purple glass as you can find. Uh, one of of the most famous spaces in his house is called the Golden Step Room. This dining room is a world away from uh, from uh, the breakers, right? Uh, you couldn't seat 40 people here. It's much more humble in its appointment, but it is beautifully cohesive in terms of the of the furniture, the seafoam green, the flatware in the background, um, the commitment to the theme with the, with the model ship over here. But there's just all of these wonderful shapes and textures in this space. And the golden step room is a great name for this room because as the sun sets, it's such a glorious space to take in a meal. Who among us wouldn't want to sit along this, um, this counter here and just gaze out at the water as you have your breakfast? Sign me up. I'm right there. So we'll end at Beauport with this last little peek from one of the one of the uh, rooms in the upper level of the house, looking through this beautiful window that he salvaged with this intimate view of the water and this gorgeous sailboat going by. This kind of strange relationship between architecture and water sort of reminded me of what we talked about with Edward Hopper too. So it's all kind of coming full circle, but we'll quickly conclude with just a few big ideas. We have seen tumultuous waves tonight. We've seen the wild ocean spray with Winslow Homer, as well as Child Hassan's serene, candy-colored sunsets over here. We've seen summer homes both quaint and absolutely palatial. And in the end, we know that it's this kind of irresistible mix of salt water and sea air that really brings us back to imagery and structures like this again and again, because we all want to be so close to it whenever it gets warm outside. So I will end there for now. I thank you again for joining us tonight and I will start taking a look at the chat and Q&A to see if I can answer any of your questions, please feel free to, um, <clears throat> to ask any more questions that you might have at this point too. Um, oh, Sally, you've been so good filling in some answers. Okay. <laughs> oh, Bianca noticed, noted that the new London beach was crowded even back then or the, or the beach in general, right? Um, let's see. Um, no questions yet. P oh, everyone no questions. Okay. Feel free great. to feel free to uh, type questions into the chat or the Q&A. Tamara, thanks for your kind words. Um, I, I mean, the sea is just calling to all of us, right? Who doesn't want to make a, 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 a another stop by the ocean before the summer is over? And these images always, always get me going. And there's a, a couple of these spots that I know I have to visit before the end of the summer. Um, Judy asked, what medium did Hassam paint in? And he was an oil painter, but some of his works, uh, especially on Apple Door Island or the Isles of Shoals were, um, were watercolors. So if we kind of zoom back there and this image, you can get a sense of some of the watercolor work. And this is an oil over here on the left. Wow. All right. I think I stumped everybody. So. <laughs> well, I'll just... Oh, Ellen, thanks for jumping in. Delawareans and others can thank the DuPont and some of the Nemore families for some of the beautiful homes that are now museums. Absolutely. I referenced um, Winchester before, and that was a DuPont family home. I was sort of blanking on the DuPont name at the time. So thanks for adding that in, Ellen. And they are unbelievable estates. If you get the chance to travel down there, I highly recommend it. And while you're in Delaware, please be sure to go see um, Longwood Gardens, one of our favorites. Oh, isn't Longwood Gardens one of the most amazing places ever? I just love it. Um, and I'll point out to everyone, um, I'll send the recording link out to everyone along with a set of um, links to many of the places that Jane mentioned tonight. Um, 
And I'm not seeing any more questions, Jane. All right. Well, uh, hopefully that just means everybody enjoyed themselves. So thank you again, everybody for joining us tonight. And I hope you come and visit us again via Zoom very yeah. soon. So on behalf of the Maynard Public Library, the Wayland Free Public Library and the Lincoln Public Library, thank you so much, Jane. Um, and I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm, I got distracted by something in the chart, in the chat. Uh, Yes, yeah, so Connie is pointing out that the Hopper exhibit at the KPN Museum um, comes before some of the things that Jane was talking about tonight when he was learning to work in watercolor um, in, I guess, in the 20s, uh, 20s and early 30s. Very cool. uh, oh, there we go. Yes, painted there in the 20s. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Connie. <laughs> uh, uh, more comments? with thank yous to Jane and um, mine as well and uh, have a lovely evening everyone and lovely summer adventures exploring the New England coast thanks a lot Jane we'll end there thank you good, good night everyone, everyone.